This morning we're going to continue again in our series of messages that we've called Christ the Healer. And today's message we're going to flow very much in the same theme as last week. Last Sunday, if you remember, we talked about talking yourself well. And as a follow-on from last week, this morning's message is all about how your words work. How your words work. That's the title that's going to frame what we talk about today. Your words work. Think for a moment about how you've been putting your words to work. Now, you may not have thought about this before, and you might not have realized just how powerful your words are and how they work and how they play out in your life. But the Bible clearly teaches us that our words have a great impact and fulfillment in our lives as they go to work. Words go to work. Your words, my words, go to work. And behind most of life's experiences are the words that created them. You see, words are never latent. They carry power and bring into being the things that come from our mouths. Very often we don't realize this. Very often we don't understand this. And we don't understand or see just how powerful the words are that come from our mouths. But the Bible teaches us very clearly that our words go to work. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, confirms this by saying these words. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The tongue, Solomon says, verse 21 of Proverbs 18, the tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, from these words in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, Solomon is telling us something that's very profound. He's revealing to us that our words go to work. The wisest of all kings confirms that there's a direct relationship between the words that we speak and the fruit that we eat in the experiences of our lives. Our, our lives unfold and materialize by our spoken words, the very words from our mouths. Our words, once spoken, go to work. That's what Solomon is showing us. They produce a harvest, a harvest of fruit that we have to consume. Solomon tells us that that harvest can be fruitful. It can be sweet and rich in taste, full of blessing and full of abundance. However, he also warns us and cautions us about how our words can go to work in telling us that the harvest can also be fruitless, dead, rancid, and bitter to the taste. And it's all largely dependent on the words that we speak. There's immense power in the tongue. There's immense power in the words that come from our mouths, either to produce things that are rich and sweet or dead, acidic and full of bitterness. Our words, you see, 
go to work. Either way, they have great power and are self-fulfilling in whatever way we use them, either to bring life or to bring death. Now, I'm sure all of us here this morning, if we went round the room, desire to see the power of life in our words. We, des we, we, we desire to see a rich, fruitful harvest of health and life and abundance in our lives. And that's certainly God's intention. That's certainly God's plan for all of our lives. He wants us to experience blessing upon blessing, an abundant life, and a life that is whole and wholesome and rich and healthy. That's His plan for all of us. However, His instructions are clear, clear to all of us. Be careful. Consider the words of your mouth before you speak them out, because your words will go to work. On another occasion in Proverbs, there's a small verse, I forget what chapter it's in, but you can look it up when you go home. And it says this, there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the mouth of the wise brings healing. There is one that speaks like the piercings of a sword. Their tongue cuts. Their tongue slashes. Their tongue is destructive and brings death. Not necessarily physical death, but destructive in its use. There's one who uses their tongue like the piercings of a sword. But the mouth of the wise, the mouth of the man or the woman that has the Word of God in it, brings forth health, brings forth life. Again, the contrast is clear that Sol Solomon parallels two lives, two, life and death, blessing and cursing, piercing like a sword or promoting health. Your tongue can do one of either. But we want to be those who have the Word of God within us, living inside of us, enabling us to speak well words of life so that we might live in the blessing of that harvest that our words bring. Because our words go to work. They really do. They're powerful. Powerful agents to bring change in our lives. Now, let's turn to Mark chapter 11 for a moment. We're going to read from verse 22 through to verse 24. And these verses are well known to us, well-known words that Jesus speaks. And in these verses, Jesus is showing us the power of our words, showing us the power and the great effect that our words can have when we place them before God, when we trust Him, and when we place our faith in Him, Jesus shows us the great effect that our words can have on the issues that we face in life, and how our words can work to bring great change, not only in our lives, but also in the life of others. Jesus here in Mark chapter 11 is showing us how to use the power of life on our tongue as we place our faith in God. Mark 11 chapter, uh, Mark chapter 11 verse 22, starting there and then reading through to verse 24, says this, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, 
and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Jesus here is talking about words that work. He's talking about your words that can go to work for you in relation to any issue of life that you might face when you place your faith and your trust in God. When you open a conversation with Him privately in prayer, you go to your knees and you call out on God and you speak to that mountain, Jesus assures us that our words, our words, We'll go to work. You see, your words are not latent. Your words are not powerless. Your words go to work, especially, especially when you place your faith in God. Jesus said, whoever. This is open to the whosoever. And I'll get to that in a little minute. It's open to anyone. The invitation is wide to all, to anyone Anywhere, everywhere. He says, have faith in God. Pray. Get your words working positively. Get your words working for your life. I've always found these words, these verses in Mark 11, chapter, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to through, through to 24. Exciting and encouraging. Whenever I've read them, I've always been excited to read them and encouraged by them because Jesus, you see, wants us all to understand that we never have to live under the shadow of of anything that would seek to intimidate us or anything that would seek to have power over us. Jesus wants us to understand that when mountains come our way, that we don't just have to live at the foot of them and put up with them. Now, mountains come in life and we face them and they're very real. And at some point in all of our lives, we've all come up against some kind of mountainous problem that seems impassable, that seems immovable, that seems beyond our ability to contend with. We all have to face them at some point. You may be facing one today. And you may be struggling to understand how you're going to get beyond what you're facing. And many of us know that when we face such mountainous issues in life, they don't just move of their own accord. They can be stubborn. They show no sign of ever moving because they're established and strong. And this is why Jesus, I believe, picks one of the most powerful images known to man, a mountain, because it symbolizes perfectly the impossibilities that often meet us in life. Mountains are a picture of strength. They're stubborn. They have might and magnificence far, far beyond our own. They're established, and they represent issues in our lives that are prolonged and defiant, that seek to wear us down. That's what a mountain does. It says to you, you're not going to move me in your own strength. You can't contend with me. I'm bigger than you. I have more might and I'm not going anywhere. You're not going to move me. 
you're going to have to live with me. That's the, the message that a mountain communicates to us. My position is established. My position is permanent. Your strength and all of your effort to move me is nothing compared to my might. I'm not going anywhere. But the words, the words, the wonderful words that Jesus speaks gives us great hope. You've got a mountain in your life that's taking up all the room in your mind. You think about it day and night. You've got a mountain in your life that seems so immovable, an issue that seems so stubborn, that will not go away, that causes you pain and grief and anguish as you think about it, and you, you try to get all of, the, all of the solutions on the table to fix things and make things work, and you're left scratching your head, tears rolling down your face because you know that your solutions is no match for the strength and the magnitude of that mountain that faces you. And you're left in despair. That's what life does. It leaves you, any one of us, in despair. But the words of Jesus, the words of Jesus come to us in our hopeless place. The words of Jesus come to us when we're sweating in the face of that mountain, trying to move it. The words of Jesus come to us to give us hope, to give us strength, to give us new life. We don't have to live under any mountain. We don't have to be intimidated anymore under its shadow. And Jesus wants us to realize that. He wants us to understand that He's not calling us to overthrow any mountain. Now, let that be known. Firstly, He's not He's not calling you to overthrow the mountain. No, He invites you to place your faith in God, right? He invites you to recognize that there's a mountain there. They're very real, right? But turn your attention away from that just a little moment. And now turn your attention to God and place your faith and your trust in Him. Turn to Him, because He's going, to over, he's going to overturn the mountain that you can't move. Now, I wish, I wish I could say it's going to be harder than that. I wish I could say it's going to be more complicated than that. I wish I could go as a teacher into the Hebrew and the Greek and try and extract some kind of different meaning to make it sound big and complicated, but I can't. You just got to turn your attention away from the magnificence of the mountain and turn it humbly to God and trust Him. It's as simple as that. It really is. You can't. I mean, it's impossible to misunderstand the simplicity of what Jesus is saying here. A child could probably better understand it than all of us and accept it. Wonderful words. No, your strength isn't being called for in relation to seeing the mountain overturned. All that Jesus is calling you to do is to trust God and then speak. He's calling you to trust God and then speak. Now, don't miss that because your words are going to go to work. Don't miss the fact that He's calling you to speak because it's conditional to move in the mountain that you may be facing. Now, can I say this? Do you know some of the mountains that we face? Not all of them. Certainly not all of them. 
but some of them have been made by our own mouths. Think about that for a moment. Some of the mountains that we face, some of the mountains that we may need moving today have actually been made by our own mouths. Now, it's not easy to admit this because usually as people, we like to defer blame. We like to defer responsibility away from ourselves. But if we get alone with ourselves and take a quiet moment and look carefully and honestly at the mountain that we're facing, not all, but some, sometimes we'll discover that we've made the very mountains that we need moving in our lives. For instance, some people have made huge mountains of relational tension and conflict. They're self-made. Self-made. And these mountains that they've made of huge relational tension and conflict tower over their lives. Mountains of tension, mountains of strife. They don't just appear from nowhere. They don't just appear in your life one, one night and you, you're scratching your head, looking up, asking the question, where on earth did this come from? No, take responsibility, you little tinker. You made it. Your words went to work. They went to work. A lot of your words, they went to work. And they made that mountain that you need moving. Others live in, or others live under mountains of hurt and rejection. And it piles up. It piles up day after day, month after month. And behind it all are spoken words from somebody's mouth. Or mountains of stress and worry and anxiety, all made by our own mouths. And sometimes we have to take responsibility for that. We have to look honestly, honestly, and examine the part that we've played in the matter of making the mountain that stands before us. But what Jesus shows us is something wonderful. It really is. Because in the verses that we've read, the very mountains that may have even been made by our own mouths can be moved by the same mouth that made it. Isn't that wonderful? He's so good. He's so good. He knows Dave Edwards. And he knows that little Dave Edwards has made a lot of mountains with his mouth. And when Dave Edwards stands looking at the mountain, scratching his head, trying to defer the blame to somebody else, and then honestly reflects and comes before God and says, Oh God, what have I done with my mouth? I've made a mountain again. I've made a mountain out of a molehill. So that's what we usually do, isn't it? Oh God. Do you know what he does? Gently. He said, Well, Dave, you made it with your mountain. Uh, you made it with your mouth. <laughs> Why don't you move it with your mouth? Have faith in me. 
He's so good. He's so wonderful. And when we send our words out to work positively, not negatively now, but positively, having prayed, having placed our faith in God, having trusted Him, maybe having repented, maybe having gone up to the person that we've offended and struck with our words and apologized and asked them to forgive us, after we've done all of that and believed, that mountain moves, that mountain goes. That mountain of intimidation, rejection, hurt, pain, fear, depression, whatever it is, no longer towers over us because we send our words to work as we place our faith in God and that mountain moves. He's so good. Our words go to work when we place our faith in God. Jesus said, whatever things you ask, When you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. That's the promise. What's he saying? He's saying your words will go to work. How have you been putting your words to work? That's the question. That's the question. How have you been putting them to work within yourself? How have you been putting them to work out into the world in which you live and wake up to every day. How have you been putting your words to work? Because your words go to work. They have power on them. They produce a harvest. They really do. What's beautiful about the verses in Mark 11 is that Jesus qualifies everyone to move mountains. You don't have to be some highly acclaimed mountaineer, acclimatized to incredible altitudes. You can be anybody. It's open to the whosoever. He says, whoever you are, have faith in God. Believe. He's not requiring our effort. I've said this. He's not requiring our strength or our strategies. None of that. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. I don't need your strength. I don't need your strategy. I don't need anything that you can do in and of yourself to try and contend with this impossible situation that's there to defy you and intimidate you. I don't need any of... I just need your faith. I just need your trust and your voice to speak. Amen. That's all I need. And in the midst of that, in the midst of that, you meet the mountain mover as you speak to it. I was just thinking over these wonderful verses in Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11 during the week. And it, it just became apparent to me as I read them and reread them and thought about them over the days before today. How God wants our involvement. He wants our involvement before He acts. He wants our involvement in all of this. He wants us to participate. He wants us to trust, yes, but He also wants us to speak, to speak to anything that's long and established, to anything that's historic in our lives, that's negative, that causes us pain, that causes us frustration, that, that inhibits our life and inhibits our growth and inhibits the wonderful things that He has planned for us. He wants us to be involved, and He wants us to speak. He doesn't want us to live in silence. He doesn't want us to just put up with things and think, well, do you know what? It's not going to change anyway. I've, I've, I've tried and tried and tried, and, and, and it seems as if 
if I'm going in circles, nothing's ever going to change about the situation that I'm in. I just give up. I'm just willing to live in silence with it. I'm, I'm, I'm put up with it. No, God wants our participation in moving mountains by placing our faith in Him and speaking to them. Because God is not going to move the mountain on your behalf. God is not going to speak to the mountain and move it on your behalf. Now, you may be waiting silently for God to move this mountain, and God is telling you to speak up. Speak to the mountain and see it moved. You can wait on God for the rest of your life until you get to heaven. But that mountain will not move because God is not going to speak to it. God is calling you to speak to the mountainous issue that you might be facing in order for it to be moved. Jesus wants us to understand this. He really does. He wants us to understand that the huge issues that sometimes come our way in life can come under the command of our own voice as we place our faith in God. God expects us to take a leading role in speaking. He really does. He expects us to take a leading role in speaking to that mountain. I tell you, God hates the mountain that you live under the shadow of more than you do. More than you do. Because He has created each and every one of us for wonderful things. He has created each and every one of us to, to, to hold His very life, to carry His very Spirit. He doesn't want us crippled up inside, living intimidated under the shadow of things that, that rule us and enslave us. But He won't speak to them. He expects each and every one of us to put our faith in Him, stand up on the inside, and speak to that thing and see it moved. He really does. Last week I told you, in length, about a skin condition that I had over my eyes for eight years. It was a severe form of of eczema. The doctor said it was incurable. It was. It was there for eight long years. And the only way that I could manage that skin condition over my eyes was with a strong steroid cream. I had to manage the condition. I just had to manage it. I had to live with the mountain. I just lived intimidated under the shadow of it, put a bit of cream on my eyes when when, when I got sore, when it got sore, just to alleviate the pain, managing the issue, living under the shadow of the mountain, just putting up with it, getting by. But the root cause of it, the root cause of it went untreated. Oh, I treated the symptoms, but I never could get to the source. I couldn't, I couldn't get to the source. I didn't know what the source was. The source was a conversation that I was having with myself on a continual basis that wasn't a good one. The Holy Spirit, one night, one Tuesday night came, and He, he, he instructed me to examine, to start examining the conversation that I was having with myself on a continual basis that wasn't a good one. And I, he began to correct it. He began to correct it through the words of my mouth with God's word. And within three days, that, cons that skin condition that was incurable, that lasted for eight long years, went. I was healed. And it never came back. It never came back. The reality was that I had made the mountain with my own mouth that I lived under. I had made the mountain. And for, for, for eight long years, it just, it, it, it was, it was, it got more stronger. It got bigger and more magnificent because my words 
We're going to work every day in making it stronger. But that night, that night the Holy Spirit set me free. And the trigger, the trigger of it was a quote from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. I told you last week, and I'll tell you again. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, have you realized yet that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you listen to yourself more than you speak to yourself? I was listening to an inner conversation with myself that had a negative, fear-filled, anxious, worry-filled content and it made a mountain in my life that affected my physical body. But that night, that night for the first time, the Holy Spirit pulled the veil back from my eyes. And I started to speak the Word of God. And within three days, I was healed. Now, I'm not saying that healing comes like this in every case. I'm not saying that the cause of sickness and pain Is, is like this all the time. It was in my case. There are many different reasons, many different causes. But the one thing that stands true in all of it is that Jesus is our healer. He's a merciful high priest. And irrespective of what causes our pain, irrespective of what causes our mountain or our sickness, irrespective of it all, he's a healer. Amen. And he's the mountain mover. Let me just finish. Maybe I shouldn't say finish. Let me just close. By saying this, in Mark chapter 5, there's an amazing testimony about a woman that had a huge mountain in her life. The mountain was 12 years old. She hadn't made this mountain. This mountain had just come about in her life as a result of her body losing blood. It wasn't something that she could control. It wasn't something that she had made. It was just one of those things that happened, an abnormality in her body that she had no control over. For 12 years, she lived under the shadow of a mountain of sickness and ill health. She went everywhere. She went everywhere to try and find help. She had an issue of blood, a flow of blood that she couldn't control from her body. And in all of that, she lost all of her money because she went to doctor and physician after physician. And they did all of their various experiments on her. And they took her money for the time that they gave her. But the Bible says this, she grew worse. After doing everything that she could do, she grew worse. She grew worse. She lost all of her money. And she was at a low place in life until, and this is the wonderful thing, until she heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus. And when she heard about Jesus, and I'll read it to you in a moment, but just to give you a little background into what we're going to read. When she heard about Jesus, the Bible says this, that she said to herself. Some translations say she kept saying to herself. She said to herself. What did she do? She put her words to work. 
that's what she did. She put her words to work. She said to herself, if I may but just touch the hem or the garment of Jesus, I shall be made whole. She started to put her words to work. She had a mountain that had escalated out of proportion in its size in her life. History of 12 years. It was established. It was permanent. It was not going anywhere. But that day when she heard about Jesus, she put her words to work and she said, if I may but just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Mark chapter 5, verse 27 to 29, says this. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. You can't explain that logically. That kind of thing to the world in which we live is ridiculous. No, it's not ridiculous. It's spiritual. It's the faith life. It's calling those things that are not as though they are. And that is what she did. She put her words to work. And they went to work. She placed faith, just seed like faith, that's all. Just a little, just a little ounce of faith. She put it in Jesus. She went out, touched the hem of his garment. The issue of blood, the hemorrhaging, stopped. The mountain was moved, and she was made whole. And Jesus said, daughter, he turned to her. He said, daughter, your faith, your faith, your faith has made you whole. Amen. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. And just as they do, I did have a little picture to show you what a mustard seed looks like proportionally to the size of a mountain. Now, when you look at the mustard seed, it's just minute, isn't it? It's small. It's insignificant. I mean, what can that do in the face of that? This morning, you may, you may be facing that. You may be facing that. But never despise the size of a seed. That's what Jesus says. Never despise the size of the seed of your faith. Never despise it. Because even though in comparison to the might of that mountain, when that seed, faith, is placed in God, hallelujah, the magnificence of God will move the mountain in your life. Do you know sometimes when I've had mountains like this in my life, do you know what I've done? I've decided to turn up at the base of it with a shovel and a wheelbarrow. I think it's because I'm from Eberville. I thought, I'm going to move you. So I go to work every day with my little shovel and my wheelbarrow. I think, I'm going to move you. I go to the base of the mountain. And every day, just a few shovels, I take a bit of the mountain away. But after a year or two, I've realized that 
It's not going anywhere. We don't have to turn up at the base of any mountain, any problem. See, God loves us so much. The Lord loves Our lives are so precious to Him. We, we can't even imagine how much He loves us. We, we can't comprehend it. And, you know, we look at our lives and, and we beat ourselves up about all of the things that are wrong in our lives. Um, and sometimes we have a very poor picture of who we are. We can't appreciate why God would ever love us because we don't love ourselves. But you know what? Blood has paid for us. Christ's blood has paid for us. He went to hell for us. He rose from the dead for us. And He's seated in heavenly places providing a place and a seat beside Him for us. That's how much He loves us. Why don't we now stop going to the base of the mountain with our little shovel and wheelbarrow? And why don't we take that little seed faith there that's in our heart? We know it's there. What we're facing is huge. It's not going to go away. It's there. And, and it's threats and it's, it's anger and, and, and it's voice that it communicates. The message that it sends, it's clear. You're not going to move me. No, that's right. That's right. We're not going to move you. We agree. We haven't got the strength. But let's use the weakness of our little faith to drop to our knees and go to God and say, Lord, you know what I'm, what I'm feeling. You know the mountain that's before me. Please move it. Jesus didn't say, shout at the mountain. Did he? He just says, speak. You can say it quietly. You can say it under your breath. You can say it privately in your heart. Just let that seed like faith take your prayer to God. The mountain will be moved. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your presence in this place. Lord, thank you for your precious people. Holy Spirit, Lord, we stand here today singing your praise, testifying that you are the mountain mover. We know you to be the mountain mover. We've seen you move mountains in our lives. We could look back and see all of the wonderful times where you've just done things for us that were completely impossible in and of ourselves. You've come through and you've answered prayer. Now today we may be facing new challenges, new mountains that seem to tower over us and intimidate us. And Lord, we're here again in need at the base of the mountain. We want to meet the mountain mover. We want to meet the mountain mover again. Whatever mountain we're facing, we want to meet you. We want to see you again move our mountain. So the little seed like faith again in our hearts, we place it in you, God, and we ask you, to move the mountains that seem so immovable that we might be facing in our lives. We ask you this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Can you say amen this morning? Amen. Listen, why don't we stand? Come on, let's stand and give thanks to God. He is so good. He is our mountain mover. And don't forget, listen, don't forget, Speak to that mountain and see it moved. Amen. God bless you. Jesus, we are here. We're here for you. We're gathered in this place to honor you. To worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. Lift 
today and Lord we thank you for your word to us it gives us life it gives us um, focus Lord and we pray Lord that you would be the words that we speak into the mountains that we face Lord we thank you that you have given us a voice and your words in our mouth have great power and Lord we want to use our mouths to speak to situations Lord we want to use our mouths to speak to situations and see your will prevail in Jesus name and everybody said amen well you may be here today and maybe you've never um, even considered 
what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You've heard people go to church, you know Christians, but you've never really considered what that would be for you today. Well, right now, I'd love to invite you into a beautiful relationship with Jesus because Jesus is really, he's like, for me, I can only describe it as, I don't know how I would go through life without him. He like gives me purpose. He gives me hope every morning when I wake up. And I have an assurance and a confidence every day that like God, the one that created the heavens and the earth is my friend and my heavenly father. And do you know what? Jesus loves each one of us so much that he wants to have that kind of relationship with each one of us. And you may be here today and you say, do you know what? I need a relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth. I need something more than what I've found so far in life. And I'd love to invite you to say a simple prayer to ask Jesus into your life today. And all he asks us to do is place our faith and trust in him. And he does the rest. So why don't you pray this simple prayer? Say something like this. Say, Jesus, I need you. Today I ask you to come and live in my life. I want a relationship with you. Thank you for loving me so much that you died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. Today, I want a brand new start. I ask you to become my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I'm telling you, you are on an amazing journey. And we would love to give you a Bible and a magazine filled with stories of people just like you who have made a decision to follow Jesus. And you can collect one of those at the end on your way out. But why don't you let us know about the decision that you've made today. On your seats, we've got a yellow card. You can fill in your details if you like. Give it to us at the back underneath the tiered seating at our connection point. And we would love to touch back with you and just encourage you in your next steps with your walk with Jesus. And our biggest encouragement would be to just keep turning up at church and watch what God is going to do. Well, just- we hope you enjoyed today's message. If you have any prayer requests, would like to share a testimony or would like to give online, why not head over to our website kings-church.org.uk. If you prayed the prayer of salvation today and would like us to contact you, To help you with your next steps, please click on the Choose Jesus button of our website. Remember you can stay connected at this time by staying in touch with your Connect and team leaders. If you are part of King's Church and are not yet connected, scroll down to our Connect Online section and we will be sure to get in touch. Thank you for tuning in. We look forward to meeting with you again very soon.